I wasn't here a couple of weeks ago when, when Caitlin preached, but I watched it online, and it was outstanding. Um, you'd not, if you actually knew her, you wouldn't believe it. Oh. <laughs> Uh, all right. Caitlin doesn't, she really doesn't just talk about this. She's lived this for her whole life. And since she's 30, 22, she's been out doing mission work in, in Uganda, and she did Central America, South America. So we really are blessed by her. And uh, she's going to take the, this team out to the homeless encampment, this Westview, right? And on the railroad track, tracks. And so it's a, it's incredible. She went out there with Danny, and uh, she met the people, and she's been uh, gathering stuff for them. So they're going to go out today, right now. You're not going to listen to Don. <laughs> That's such a bummer. Can I go with you guys? <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. That we're word workers. That, Lord, we just don't hear your word, but we do your word. And, Lord, we thank you for these wonderful people who are serving you. And taking the risk of faith and stepping out into the work of your kingdom. So, Lord, we bless them and we send them with your favor and your grace. And, Lord, your wisdom. Speak. Amen. 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 Is this is this going out? Because um, is there another one? Can we switch to the other one, Dave? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for that team. Um, good stuff going on. It's, it's so exciting, and uh, this is what Caitlin is calling Church Outside the Walls. Yeah. Caitlin has such a heart for missions and ministry, and uh, we're looking for every opportunity to jump into everything that God has for us. So be praying as I speak for them. I think it's going to be awesome. Okay, I'm starting a series today, um, a series uh, entitled... Follow me, and I just want to show you a little thing that Daniel did for me here. Follow me. Two simple little words. Follow me. Implying that Jesus is on the move from here to wherever. And in order to follow him, I would have to stop what I'm doing, get up, and go where he leads. Now, how do I do that? I mean, it's not like I can be in two places at once, right? I mean, what about my job, my responsibilities, my life? And then when he leads me to wherever, well, then what? What do I do there? Is this an ongoing going, always moving, never stopping? I mean, what if I want to get married, have children? Do, do they follow with me or do they follow him in their own way? I mean, what about my plans, my dreams? Do they matter? Is this follow me, him? Is this a, a literal follow him wherever he leads? Just walk away from everything, everyone? Why would anybody ever want to do that? Why would anyone ever want to do that? There are two simple words. Follow me. And, and I think they're two of the most profound words Jesus ever spoke in the Bible. You know, we, we tend sometimes, if you've been a Christian for a while, um, we tend to clutter up this life that we've been called to. 
we clutter it up with things that, uh, that we've been told are good things to clutter it up with. And, and so for the last couple of weeks, you know, I shared a couple of weeks ago about my friend David and how he's impacted my life when we sent him flowers that were wrapped in bubble wrap. And, and for him, it was one of the greatest things that had ever happened in his life. He said um, no one had ever sent him flowers. And he said, I, for the first time, I feel that I, I'm loved and I can love people. And it was just a small little thing, wasn't it? Follow, just flowers. And so I've really been kind of on this thing in my life where I'm going, okay, how much clutter do I really have in all of the areas of my life? And so as I've been praying, um, I felt like the Lord said, you know, as we start this season, uh, this year, um, we're going to talk about what it is to follow him. And I think we all have our impressions of what that looks like. I mean, for each one of us, you know, it's, it's um, you've, if you've been in the church at any length of time, um, that looks a certain way for you. You've learned certain things. You've said, okay, this is what it looks like to follow. And, and I'm going to ask you for the next few weeks to maybe kind of put that stuff aside for a minute and reevaluate what it is to follow, what it means. I think we have a tendency to complicate it, to overthink sometimes, maybe to look past the simple things, the obvious things, and perhaps believing that the obvious things are just too easy and it can't be that easy. I don't think I'm alone when I say this. You know, there's an old saying that says, if it, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And maybe that applies here. Maybe it does. Maybe what Jesus says when he says, follow me, maybe it's really too good to be true. It, there, we kind of live like there has to be more to it than that, don't we? I think in the church we really get caught up in that. He, he simply said, follow me. And, and we've now attached all kinds of stuff to that. Okay, and, and so I want to kind of just detach that stuff for a minute and say maybe it's not too good to be true. Maybe it is true. Maybe, just maybe, there's something that we keep looking past in our lives. You see, I, I, I tend to have these lenses through which I evaluate life. And I think all of us do. They're lenses of past experience, possibly, that cause us to look at things in a cautious way at times. So the lenses that we look at things through will tend to keep us safe at times, won't they? It's like, I've experienced hurt there. I never want to experience that again. And so what we do is we just make a decision that that's the way that is, and I'm not going to go there. And we may end up missing something very valuable. Those lenses, they can keep us safe, but they can also keep us stuck where we are. Because really we're unable or unwilling to go to those places that for us may be a little bit unknown. I want to stay in what I know and stay safe. So this year, I'm looking at getting rid of some of the clutter in my life, in my belief systems. See, I've been, I've been raised in the church and I've always believed in God. That's, that's crazy. Um, I, I, my family was a Christian family. I went to church all the time. Um, I have uh, three brothers. Uh, my three brothers all became pastors. I, uh, I didn't want to. Um, now none of them are and I am. So, um, but I was raised in this, this Christian home in, in learning how I'm supposed to live my life. Um, every week going to church and I'm trying to understand what this meant. But, you know, there, there was a time in my life where I came to a place where I began to question my faith a bit. I didn't want to believe just because my parents had told me or that's what I was raised to believe. If it was true, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, stubborn. And for me, if it's true, 
then God himself can show me it's true. I don't have to take somebody else's word for it. And so if he doesn't show me, then maybe it's not true. I've always been a little stubborn that way. I don't live my life by shoulds. I question everything. And so there was a time in my life where I, my faith, I began to question it. My faith, quite honestly, had become about just doing the right things. You know, just learn more and do better. That's kind of what the process became for me, going to church. And I think I see that so often in the church, even today. It's like, let's just sit and learn more, and we'll just try to do better. And that's what our Christian life becomes. It's, it's a bunch of, don't, don't do those things over here. Don't eat this. Don't drink that. Make sure you do this. Read your Bible. Go to church. Pray. All of a sudden, there are all these things that I'm supposed to do or not supposed to do. And quite honestly for me, I found that I started to get angry at the church and at church people. Maybe some of you have experienced it. I'm guessing that um, some of you have. I, uh, I remember I was in, I was in college, uh, my first year in college in, in Portland, Oregon. And it was a very frustrating time for me. My, my view of the church and church people was not really good that time. And so I, I started feeling like, as I looked around, like I was honestly trying to live my life for God, but all of these people that claimed to be Christians were failing miserably. And I got really frustrated about it. They would say one thing and do another. And for me, it was like so important that you do the right things. And don't you know? And I would teach. And what I found was I began to become judgmental about people in the church. So um, one night, it was a Saturday night, I decided I'm just going to go for a walk. I'm telling God off. I've had this. I've had it. And so I went for a walk. It was in Portland. And there's this school that I went to. It's on the, it's, it says it's nestled in... Mount Tabor's bosom, that's their, what they would, so there's a Mount Tabor, and the school was nestled in its bosom, I guess. I just, I don't know why they said that, but they did, and it just stuck with me. Um, so I went past the bosom of Mount Tabor, and, and it was late at night, it was probably about midnight, and I just, I'd reached this point of frustration where it was like, okay, fine, um, I've had it, and as I'm walking, it's dark, and I'd never been past the bosom of Mount Tabor before. And I'm walking along, and I begin to yell at God. I begin to tell him off. Now, I, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but God was really gracious with me, and he let me yell and scream at him. And if you had seen me, you probably would have called a, a psych ward somewhere. But I remember as I was walking, and I said, if you're real then send an angel right now to talk to me because I've had it. If you're real, prove yourself to me. I've had it. And you know, it was amazing. No angel came. <laughs> so I walked a little further and I thought, well, maybe that was too big a request of God. And I remember I, I came to this large tree and I said, fine then. If you're not going to send an angel, it's raining. Go ahead, strike this with a lightning bolt so that I'll know you're real. You didn't strike it with a lightning bolt. And, and as, I, as I continued to just be upset, I remember asking a question. It was like when I finally calmed down a little bit. And I said, God, I need to know why I serve you. I need to know why I serve you because... Right now, it's just very frustrating for me. Um, I spoke those words, and when I looked around, I realized I was lost. I had no idea what direction I had to go to get back to the school. And so it took me a couple of hours to finally um, uh, navigate my way back to school. And it was now early morning hours. And the next morning, like a good Christian young man that I was, I got up, I didn't miss church. 
I got up and I went to church. And I remember it was one of the most amazing things. Um, we did worship, wonderful worship. It was a, a church, I think it was a four square church. A guy named Jerry Cook was the pastor. And I remember Jerry got up to speak and he was beginning a series on uh, Second Peter. And it went something like this. Jerry got up and he opens his Bible and he says, uh, beginning our series now in Second Peter, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And then he paused. And he looked at it again and he said, Simon Peter, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And then he just kind of looked around the room and he said, I, I wasn't planning on saying anything about this, but someone here needs to know why you serve God. <laughs> and I sat up. He began to tell me what a bond servant was. He began to tell the church, but it was for me. You see, a, a bond servant is one who had been a slave because he'd been, he basically was owned by this person and he had to do whatever that person, whatever his master told him. He was a slave. But then there comes a day where the master says, I'm going to set you free now from being a slave. No longer do you need to be a slave. Well, a bond servant is one that says, goes back to that master and says, I, I don't serve you because I have to. I serve you because I love you. Amen. And then that master would take that servant out to a post or a tree and pierce his ear and put an earring in it that, that signified he was serving his master out of love because he wanted to. And it hit me again why it was that I serve God. You see, I think every one of us, we need to know why it is that we serve God. That was my question and really didn't expect the answer like that. But God didn't strike a tree, didn't send an angel, but he spoke to Jerry Cook and directly answered my question that next day. A slave has been set free and he chooses to serve because of his love for the master. And then I remembered the year prior to that, I was living down here in California in an unfurnished apartment when I had a remarkable experience with God. And it's one that I hadn't really thought about for about a year after. And it's found, I was reading in John 15, they're going to put the verses up for you. John 15, verses 12 through 17. And this is what I read. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servant, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friend. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that, or these things I command you so that you will love one another. It's interesting, I, I'm sure that I had read that passage many times before, but that that evening that I was sitting on the floor in my apartment, suddenly this jumps out at me. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. For his friends. Can you think of a greater love, any greater devotion, any greater friend than someone who would give up his life for you? Then Jesus went on to say, you're my friend. And, and I remember I just began to cry because I'd never seen Jesus as a friend. I'd seen him as a Lord and master, one that I had to serve, 
that I had to live up to some obligation, that I had to, to do the right things, believe the right things, or I might go to hell. Pretty much, that was the extent of my theology. And now Jesus says to me, hey, um, I didn't, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I want you to be my friend. And it just, it rocked me. When Jesus says, follow me, what he's doing is he's choosing you. He's choosing you to have relationship with him. He's saying, I want to get to know you and I want you to get to know me. Would you come with me and be my friend? Would you be my neighbor? <laughs> that isn't in my notes, I just came. The Lord must have downloaded that one. So it wasn't the first time I'd heard these words, but it was the first time I saw them. It was the first time that they impacted me in some way. My life had become cluttered with religious activity trying to believe all the right things, trying to do all the right things. And you know, I've come to realize that Jesus didn't come to have us jump through hoops. That's not why he came. He didn't come for us to become some kind of circus act that would do things for him. He came so that I could get to know him. He said he came to reveal the love of the Father to us. Throughout the gospel, the invitation that Jesus continues to extend is this. Simple. Follow me. Follow me. Would you follow me? There are 23 times we'll see it in the Gospels. For all different kinds of people. From the worst of the worst to the most righteous of the righteous. From poor to wealthy and everything in between. He extends that invitation to us. It's simple. It's two words. You can't mess this up. Follow me. You can memorize that. I can. 58 times you're going to read verses if you go through the Gospels about verses about following Jesus. It's the one thing he asks me to do. That's it. Can I just tell you, if you want one thing to do, this is it. If you do this, you don't need to do anything else. I'm going to really lower the bar for you. Follow him. Follow him. It's not about being religious. It's not about being good enough. It's not about knowing the right things. It's not about the next spiritual experience. It's not about any of that. It's the same call that he calls to us over and over again. And so the question that I ask this morning is, are you following? See, this is the question that I really want to camp on for a while, for us as a body and for me as an individual, and I hope for you as an individual, that we will stop and we will think, when everything else is going, what's he want me to do? Follow him. That's it. That's Nothing else. Follow me. There's a man that we're going to talk about more in depth next week. This man was a, a tax collector. And in Matthew 9, we read about it. It's actually written by the very guy that it's talking about. It's written by Matthew, and he's talking about the story uh, of Jesus asking him to follow. And, and it, says, it says, And Jesus went from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Pretty simple. He didn't 
say anything else. Matthew, would you follow me? Now, the, the, the real interesting thing about this is if you know about tax collectors in that time, they were pretty much the scum of the earth. They were hated by most of the Jewish people because they had betrayed their people. They were hired by people that um, Rome had hired to take taxes from people, and they could set those taxes wherever they wanted. They just had to pay the person that hired them what he wanted, and then they could take anything extra. And so the people were taxed for everything. And Matthew could put that in his pocket and be happy and make a great living. There's nothing worse than a tax collector. There's no one more undeserving than a tax collector. If you think you're not deserving, now the truth is, you're not. But it doesn't stop him. It doesn't matter what you've done, who you are, who you've done it with, when you did it, if you're doing it now, it doesn't matter. Jesus looks at this tax collector and he says, follow me. Imagine hanging out with Jesus and suddenly he comes up to somebody you absolutely detest and says, hey, um, I want you to come be part of my, my group of folks. And you're standing there going, I don't want him to be with us. I got nothing in common with that guy. He's, he stole from me. He's a tax collector. Jesus, you're going to ruin my reputation. You're going to ruin your reputation. I want nothing to do with Matthew. I don't want to be associated with the likes of him. What would people think? What was Jesus thinking? Then Matthew, it's really interesting what happens, what Matthew says next. Then Matthew tells us that he got up and followed. Crazy. Matthew joined with Jesus at that moment. Jesus looks into the eyes of Matthew and here, Matthew knew who Jesus was. Jesus was a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was an important person. He already had many people following him. And for some reason, he singles Matthew out. And he says, he looks him in the eye and he says, Matthew, would you just follow me? Come on, would you, would you hang out with me? Would you be with me? You see, that's the call that Jesus extends to all of us. That's the call. It, it, it's not, would you jump through all of these hoops and do all of these things and say all of these things? It's, would you just follow me? It's a very simple call. So here's what I'm asking us to do for the next few weeks. My hope is that, that we will all begin to put aside all the stuff that we've learned try to put down all the filters that you see through and begin again to look at the simplicity of this invitation. Follow me. Maybe like me, you've begun to add to that, attach things to that. This is what it's supposed to look like. And, and, and now I'm, look at me, I'm, I'm actually a very mature Christian because that's what I did. And then I start getting angry at those that weren't working as hard as me at it. Don't they know? Bunch of hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Right? Follow me. If you could erase your memory banks about everything that you've heard about Jesus, just go blank and get rid of all the clutter. If you were to start with a blank slate and just read through the Gospels, you would find that life with God, life with Jesus is all about relationship. It's extraordinarily relational. That's all that it's about. It's all about relationship. The relationship that, believe it or not, he wants to have with you. No matter who you are or what you've done. 
He came for that very reason. Listen, he was sitting in heaven. There was no reason for him to come. He had everything. But he came because he loves you. If your approach to Christianity is anything less or more than relational, if your approach is knowing more or doing better, then perhaps you've missed something. Because you've been invited, and I have been invited, into an extraordinary relationship with God. Maybe you've been to church all your life, and you became like me. Your relationship became learn more, do better, gain some kind of experience, get some kind of spiritual gift so you look more spiritual than the next person, and then fake it so people don't see it. I mean, a lot of us do that, don't we? We live one life outside, I don't want to be scolding. But the reality is, we live a life out there and then we come in here and we don't let people see us, really, really see us, do we? Some of us, we just hide. You know, I, I love that, that Carl has been actually sharing with us some of the stuff that he's going through. I mean, he could get up here and he could just say, hey, life's cherry, God's got it. To be that person that says, here's who I am. It's only then that you can be set free from the things that bind you. Maybe you've considered giving up on this whole Christian thing. You've grown tired, frustrated by it all. Maybe you've been turned off by the church or hurt by the church in some way. Can I tell you that if you've been hurt by the church, that wasn't Jesus. That wasn't Jesus. Maybe you just don't believe in God at all. You know what? Even that is okay. Because as we move through this series, I'm going to address that a little bit. And I'm going to address, you saw a few questions that are going to be addressed in the series. Wherever you are with God for the next couple of weeks, I want to challenge you to take a chance. I want to challenge you to look again. Hit the reset button as best you can and consider again. Jesus' call is not complicated. He simply asks you to follow him. He says, look, I want to be your friend. I, I want to be your friend. For me, I forgot that part of it. Because um, I then began to prove to him that I was worthy of his call. Wherever you are with God this morning, wherever you are, I'm asking you to look again. Look into the eyes of Jesus. Again, as if for the very first time. And see that he's not condemning you. He's not scolding you. He's lovingly looking at you and saying, Hey, would you follow me? Would you hang out with me? I want to get to know you. And I, I think that we would really hit it off I, as you get to know me. I think we could have a really good relationship. That's what he's asking us. And that's what we'll be looking at for the next few weeks. So, I leave you with this simple question. Are you following? That's it. He's asked you, he's called you, would you, would you follow me? He hasn't said, do you have certain spiritual gifts so that you look mature? He hasn't said anything about how you're supposed to live at this point and how you're supposed to think. He's just saying, come here, hang out with me, would you please? And that's an invitation that's going to be really hard as, you, as we go through this series. It's going to be really hard to ignore and say no to. Amen? Amen. All right. Aaron, if you'll come up, and Carl, if you'll come up, we'll go ahead and close out the service. You guys are amazing. Love you a bunch. Amen. Um, we, we, 
we don't like just to talk about God. We don't like just to talk about serving. We like to respond. And so when the word is preached and it's hidden our hearts, uh, then we need to respond to it. So I'm just going to ask you to simply stand if, if the Lord has spoken to you about where you're at and what you need to do as we worship, okay? So just as you, as you think about it, if there was something that was said that this was for you, like, like it was for Don in that one ser- service, then, then stand, okay?
don't just talk about it, but we do it. We just follow you, Lord. And we just do what you do. So, Lord, bless this group, this people. May you show your favor to them. And may they represent you well in the sphere of influence that they have. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We'll have more prayer in the donor room. For those who want some more prayer. The prayer room. The prayer room? The donor room. All right. Bless you.